Tonight on Denver 7 News at 6. Because we've lost a really good person. Denver 7 has learned the Good Samaritan killed Monday was killed by police. Chief Investigator Tony Kowaleski has details. Plus, the battle lines are being redrawn in Colorado. Democrats worry they're at a disadvantage. And wildfires chop through thousands of acres and choke the metro with smoke. We're going to see uh, this fire continue to grow. Good evening, and thanks for watching Denver 7. I'm Ann Trujillo. And I'm Shannon Ogden. We're glad you're with us tonight. The man who stepped in during Monday's deadly shooting in Arvada and who was described by officers as a good Samaritan was killed by police. And that we know based on multiple conversations with multiple sources. What exactly transpired, what led to Johnny Hurley being killed after confronting a gunman is something we are still trying to understand. Denver 7's Ivan Rodriguez has been speaking with people who knew Johnny Hurley. We're going to hear from him in just a moment. We're going to begin the broadcast with Denver 7 Chief Investigator Tony Kovaleski who confirmed this story and has details on it for us tonight, Tony? Yeah, good evening, Shannon and Ann. Let me begin by saying these are difficult details to share because these are life and death decisions made in an instant. In the hours after the shooting, Arvada police have confirmed the gunman was responsible for the brutal murder of Officer Gordon Beasley. We know that Samaritan John Hurley has been credited with heroic actions, but until now, we did not know who killed the gunman and who was responsible for killing Samaritan Hurley. What we are sharing with you comes from three ranking and informed sources at the highest levels. As Arvada PD did confirm, the gunman shot and killed Officer Gordon Beasley. After that, Samaritan John Hurley responded to the sound of gunshots and shot and killed the gunman. Our sources telling us Samaritan John Hurley was killed by gunfire from a responding officer. Our news team has been in lengthy discussions with Arvada leaders today, making sure they were aware of the information that we've uncovered. In response to our calls, Arvada PD offered this statement. We will not confirm until the investigation team finishes its interviews and reviews forensic information. More context for you now. To date, Arvada PD has not said how Samaritan Hurley was killed, only calling him a hero. We must stress this is not an indictment on the decision by the officer in a very tense and clearly a life and death situation. We now know the missing details. We know it is standard protocol in these situations to conduct ballistic reviews and those take time. It's also standard to conduct extensive interviews with witnesses and first responders. The Jefferson County Sheriff's Office is now leading this investigation. We expect to hear more in the next 48 hours from Arvada PD. Ann? We know there's a lot to filter through. Tony, thank you for that. Now, Denver 7's Ivan Rodriguez has spent the day learning more about Johnny Hurley. He joins us now. And Ivan, what are you learning? Well, friends tell me they're still processing the loss of Johnny Hurley. Based on the man who he was, they tell me they're not surprised that he stepped in when he heard the gunshots. People who were close to Johnny Hurley tell me he was a man who had a heart for people and was also an outspoken activist in the community. Hurley was 40 years old and lived in Denver. Witnesses tell Denver 7 when Hurley heard the gunfire, he ran towards it and saw the gunman in the plaza. Other business owners say they heard Hurley tell people to run to safety before confronting the gunman and shooting him. One of Gurley's friends tells me it's saddening if he was killed by police because through his activism work, he had a desire to change the system of policing. I'm just curious about what actually happened. Um, you know, what, whether, whether, whether he was shot by the police or, you know, kind of what happened because it's the, the, the irony here is just that, you know, he was, he was kind of distrustful of authority. Uh, systems and, um, you know, but he, but he did care about people. So, I mean, I could totally see him coming out there and, and trying to, to stop a, a, a bad situation from occurring. We also reached out to Hurley's family and they tell us that they're still processing the loss as well of his loss. Ivan Arvada, Ivan Rodriguez, Denver 7. Ivan, thank you. And earlier today, we caught up with a neighbor of the gunman, Ronald Troika, and she told us Troika was always calm, never untoward, beyond an occasional hi, how you doing? She didn't have any interaction with him. And it doesn't seem like any of the other neighbors did either. It was a little wow. devastating, you know, because I have my kids here and we're like right there. We didn't know what was going on, and so it's kind of devastating, but the neighbors have been kind of coming together and trying to connect, I, th I think trying to make sense of what happened. 
Arvada police say the shooter expressed hate toward law enforcement. The most serious offense on his criminal record was a misdemeanor assault charge from 1992. And it seems like everyone knew Officer Gordon Beasley. His patrol car tonight is just covered with notes and balloons and flowers. Amy Petkoff teaches eighth grade at the school where Beasley served as the SRO. And to say she and her students will miss him is an understatement. We had a little kindergartner that just had some struggles and uh, they had decided as part of a reward because the little kid, it turns out, really just looked up to police officers. So the reward was that he would get to meet with him if he'd been doing what he needed to do. He'd come by once a week and just hang with him. And the kid just loved that. You can learn more about Officer Beasley and also how you can help his family by visiting the DenverChannel.com. Well, the man who shot and permanently altered the life of Colorado Springs police officer Jem Dizel has been found guilty of attempted murder. Karar al Kasami shot Dizel in the head as he was checking out reports of shots fired. Well, that was back in 2018. Now, Dizel has spent years recovering, and last we'd heard, he has moved out of state to live near family. 130 people are now fighting the Sylvan Lake fire near Eagle. 3,500 acres are burned. Hot, dry, windy conditions are making it very difficult to contain. Same goes for the muddy slide fire, which blew up overnight and is now at 3,500 acres. This is about 18 miles as the crow flies from Kremlin. Evacuations have been ordered for a 12-mile stretch of road. Cass Cairns is a spokesperson for the fire crew. She says we'll probably be seeing worse fires than this one if Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. It's all going to depend on you know, the, or, you know, the weather in the future. Normally in the middle of July, we will get monsoonal rains. Last year, we didn't get them. That's how Cameron Peak ended up getting as big as it did. Uh, if we don't get the monsoonal rains this year, we could be looking at another really bad year. And that fire, as well as one burning out by Rangeley, responsible for choking Denver with this smoke we're seeing today. Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson joins us now. And Mike, uh, should we expect more of this tomorrow? Uh, a little bit tomorrow, but it's going to get better into the weekend because of a change in the weather pattern. Here is the national smoke map. You can see the areas highlighted in the red and yellow. That's the worst of the smoke. Notice how it's still pretty thick over us tomorrow, but spreading to the east, and it gets better as we head into Friday, and that is courtesy of a weather front that's coming our way. There's a cold front slipping down across northern Colorado. Fire weather warnings and smoke conditions continue over western Colorado right now. There are just isolated thunderstorms here, but a severe thunderstorm watch up in Nebraska along that cold front. So the headlines actually are some good news for us. Haze and smoke continue for tonight and tomorrow, but cooler weather is coming. Rain on the way for much of Colorado and a cooler, wetter pattern over the weekend into early next week. I'll have all the details in the seven day in about 10 minutes. All right, some good news here. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so take notes or hit record right now because there is a lot to unpack regarding Colorado's congressional districts. The Independent Commission charged with drawing the lines released their first draft today. If approved, Pueblo goes to District 4, that is Ken Buck's district right now, and much of the high country and essential, essentially all of the West Slope will be covered by District 3, represented currently by Lauren Boebert. District 5, now almost solely Colorado Springs, that's Doug Lamborn's seat, and the Metro, yeah, a little bit more nuanced. District 8, which is being added, this is the new one because of our population growth, will contain Arvada, Westminster, Thornton, Broomfield, and parts of Weld County. And that, of course, shifts the districts around it. And Democrats believe that shift could hand another seat to Republicans. Now, the committee says this is still early in the game. This should be viewed very much so as a very preliminary plan just to um, give the public a, a map to start to look at so that they can um, identify communities of interest in particular that they believe should be uh, contained in a district and be able to tell the commission um, and staff where those communities of interest are. Now, this is an exhaustive process that, of course, could have a big impact on who Colorado sends to Washington. You can read more of our coverage on Denver 7 Plus. An effort to upend the livestock industry as we know it has failed. Initiative 16 would have banned ranchers from slaughtering animals until they lived a quarter of their lives would have also classified artificial insemination as an illegal sexual act. The state Supreme Court essentially ruled the measure bites off more than a single initiative can chew under the Constitution, and they threw the proposal out.
course, it was unlikely to pass anyway. The state auditor says Colorado's Department of Labor and Employment fell short of the mark when handling unemployment claims. The audit found the department failed to match payment amounts with employer records. It also cites a backlog of claims that had not been resolved at the end of the fiscal year. It says the state overpaid by $52 million. We reached out to the Labor Department for comment. They told us there's nothing in the report they didn't know already and hadn't shared already. They said they've already made adjustments and insist they will be better prepared in the future. Mid to upper 90s today, but 70s and rain are in the seven day. A safe space for people experiencing homelessness just opened in Park Hill. Organizers hope there'll be more like it. There's over a thousand people that are sleeping on the streets tonight, but we don't have to live in a city like that. 